So how does the internet work? It's not magic. It's a bunch of cables and hardware and electricity. Yeah, the internet can seem like magic. There's messages flying through the air, but in reality, it's made up of a bunch of physical infrastructure. So your device, your phone, your laptop, has a tiny radio in it that allows it to communicate with a cell tower or with your home's Wi-Fi. And then from there, a cable connects your internet from there to your internet service provider. Bigger cables connect your ISP to other ISPs. And then there are these really hefty undersea cables that connect every continent to one another. And all along these cables, there are machines called routers that check where a message is supposed to go and send it along to another router that is slightly closer to the destination until it eventually gets to where it's going. And this all happens really, really fast. The messages are sent as electrical signals or pulses of light, so they can actually be traveling almost the speed of light. And it can feel instantaneous. But all of that is happening over very real physical infrastructure. And this brings up a key point about the vulnerability of the internet and of the information traveling through the internet. There are lots of choke points, like those undersea cables, where there's a lot of messages that have to travel through a relatively small pipeline. And at those choke points, it can be easy for someone to disrupt the internet, either by physically damaging the cable or by using the choke point as a centralized place to monitor messages passing through it. So you might be wondering, how does all this infrastructure know where to send things? The internet needs an addressing system. And for that, it uses IP or the internet protocol. So routers, those machines that route internet traffic through the system, they have to know where to send things. So right now, YouTube is streaming this video to your computer. YouTube breaks up the video into little chunks called packets and sends them in your direction. Each one of those little packets has your IP address written on it. The routers read that IP address and they pass along the packet to the next router that is slightly closer to you until the packets eventually reach your device. But IP addresses aren't very human friendly. There are two types of IP addresses, IPv4, Internet Protocol version 4, and IPv6. And neither of them are really easy for humans to remember. So for example, one of YouTube's IPv4 addresses is and one of its IPv6 addresses is, and you do not want to have to remember that and type it in every time you visit YouTube, which is why we have domain name system. And the way this system actually works is that when you type youtube.com into your browser, your computer sends out a query to a nearby machine called a DNS resolver. When a DNS resolver receives a request, it reads the domain name and then looks up the matching IP address. Now, sometimes the DNS resolver already knows the IP address. And for a popular site like YouTube, lots of people are asking for that address all the time. So it may just have it already stored in its cache and can just return that information to you. But other times, if it doesn't already know the IP address that the domain resolves to, the DNS resolver will check with other machines called name servers until it finds the matching IP address. Then it just sends the matching IP address back to your computer, and your computer can now use that IP address to connect to YouTube.com. And all of this, the physical infrastructure, the IP address system, the domain name system, and a whole bunch of other stuff is what happens every time you do something online, like when you send an email. But email brings up another important point about third-party services like Gmail or Outlook. So when you use an app like Gmail, you're not actually directly sending packets from your computer to the recipient's computer. Like if I'm sending an email to my mom using Gmail, my computer is not sending packets from my computer directly to my mom's computer. Instead, my computer is sending packets to Gmail's servers. It's Gmail's IP address that will be on the packets coming out of my computer. Gmail servers then store that information, and then they also pass on those packets to whatever email application my mom is using, let's say Outlook. And then my mom's email application takes that information and stores it so that it's ready for my mom whenever she opens Outlook and decides to read it. Now this is really useful and it's important because this is how you are able to check your email easily from anywhere. Your mom doesn't have to know 
my home IP address, and you don't have to run a dedicated email server to my house just so that I can receive email. Instead, Gmail does all of that for me, and I just go to Gmail's website or app. So lots of people out in the world have heard of the Great Firewall of China. But in our article, we actually use a different term, the lock net. And when we say lock, we don't mean lock and key. What we're talking about is water lock. So a series of sluices that can hold or release water through a channel. Now the lock net has three main components, three levels. The first is the network level censorship, which sometimes gets called the Great Firewall, which exists to stop foreign information from getting into China. The next part is the service level censorship, which requires platforms inside China, like Douyin or even app stores, to follow the government's censorship rules. And the final part of this system is the real life laws and law enforcement, what we call meat space. In China, if you post something you shouldn't, you could get called into your local police station to account for it or even sent to jail. So the lock net is not just about keeping foreign information out. It's also about managing domestic information and also encouraging self-censorship. A wall is static, but this system is really dynamic, which is why we think it's more akin to controlling flows of water. And importantly, it is not perfect. There are leaks all the time in all sorts of different ways. But overall, the system is really effective. Something else that's really important to know about this system is that the Chinese party state view it as existential to the survival of their regime. They're never going to give it up. How does China actually censor the internet? The Chinese government keeps foreign information out of the country through network level censorship. So first, they tamper with addressing information stored on routers near the country's physical borders. When a computer inside China tries to connect to a website abroad, it has to first consult that information. Fake addressing information will lead the user's computer to think that the foreign website isn't available, and it essentially just gives up. Second, the network level censorship system monitors the connection between domestic and international machines. And then when it sees something it doesn't like, it injects a command to the machines at both ends to reset or end the connection. This is a really widely used mechanism and a very important one because it doesn't slow down internet traffic. Third, network level censorship system can actually also stop information from flowing back and forth between two machines. So it uses this mechanism less often because it does slow down the connection. Fourth, the network level censorship system seeks out machines that are trying to evade the censorship system. It sends out little test messages to those machines. And if those machines respond in any kind of way that suggests they're running circumvention software, the system essentially makes it so that no one can connect to those machines. Now for domestic information, they also have local companies like Douyin or Red Note carrying out service level censorship. And both network and service level censorship are underpinned by real world laws and consequences. Ultimately, our project ended up being a lot bigger than just a technical explanation of China's online censorship. We ended up exploring some other major concepts we hope people will take away. Sometimes censorship is overt. People know that you're doing it. Like back in the 2000s, if Chinese people searched for a censored term on Google or Baidu, they would get a notice that some results couldn't be displayed. But there's less and less of this type of censorship now. There's also covert censorship, and people don't know when covert censorship is happening. So for example, those censored search results, you don't get any kind of notice. You just don't get some results and you have no idea that you didn't get them. Covert censorship is usually better from the censor's perspective because it's hard for people to get angry about not knowing they're being censored. It also makes it much harder for you as a user to mentally counteract it. You just don't know what you don't know. Now, some things are so sensitive, like the Tiananmen Square massacre, that the censor doesn't just want people to not talk about it. They want to erase it from collective memory. This is called memory holding. And this means that the censor can't just write a rule publicly saying that people can't talk about that thing. And the censor can't let on that it is censoring that thing. So by definition, memory holding requires using covert censorship methods. One of these is the idea of censorship versus the idea of content moderation. It's really important in our modern world for people to have a clear understanding of this distinction. Both censorship 
and content moderation occur everywhere in the world, but the scale and scope of them vary dramatically depending on where you are and what rules you're subject to. So we use a two-part test to determine if something is censorship or content moderation. Now, censorship first is done at the behest of a government. And second, it is done with a threat of a specific tangible consequence for not complying. Now, all governments censor something, most commonly child sexual abuse material or CSAM. The difference with censorship in China is how many categories of speech are censored and the fact that so much censorship is covert. And finally, the fact that what is censored can and does change day by day. Now, content moderation is anything that a company does of its own accord, not because the government told them to. So the rules that Twitter or Facebook used to have to curb harassment and the rules that they still have regarding spam, those weren't censorship. Those were just garden variety content moderation that they were doing on their own. How does China's censorship of its own internet affect those of us outside China? So first of all, if you're on an app that's designed for a Chinese user base, like Red Note, you are subject to China's censorship. But even if you're using a foreign version of a Chinese app, like the foreign version of WeChat, your data still helps train the censorship models that get used against domestic Chinese users. DeepSeek and other Chinese-built LLMs have varying degrees of censorship baked into them, even the ones that are less censored when you run them outside China. Some of this is in the information they're willing to provide you, but some of it is in the way that that information is presented and framed. And all of this is happening covertly, which means you can't see it. You don't know what they're not telling you, and it's really hard to guard against. Companies outside China are already integrating these models into their systems. Technologies that allow for easier internet surveillance and censorship are also getting built into some of the internet systems that Chinese technology company Huawei is selling abroad. That doesn't mean that these systems will necessarily get used to surveil and censor, but it certainly makes it easier should a government decide they want to do it. And if these particular technologies get accepted as international standards, they could end up making it easier for governments everywhere to surveil and censor. These standards do allow for much faster and much more efficient communication. Now, the future is moving towards systems that do more things automatically and require less human oversight. The reason that people are using LLMs for search is because it's easier to have a system tell you the answer than it is to have to go to a bunch of websites one by one. But this structural change also lends itself to covert censorship, the kind that China excels at. 